right, welcome back. Uh, we are going to continue our exploration of Chapter 5 of Campbell's Biology. Um, and before, while we explained what these large macromolecules were, these large uh, biological molecules, what we are going to do now is go into each of the classes and discuss what makes those classes a class, what is unique to the function of each one of those classes. So we're going to start off here with carbohydrates, so concept 5.2. Carbohydrates serve as fuel and as building material. Now, carbohydrates can certainly do more than these two things, um, but we are going to start off from this place. Uh, in class, we can talk about some of the additional functions that we see with carbohydrates. Now, uh, carbohydrates include sugars and polymers of those sugars. The simplest carbohydrates are called monosaccharides, meaning one sugar, okay? Or we can simply call this simple sugars. When we talk about carbohydrate macromolecules, we're typically talking about polysaccharides. Poly meaning many, saccharide meaning sugar, so many sugars. These are large polymers of monosaccharides. Okay. Now, what is a monosaccharide? It has a base formula of CH2O. Okay. And all saccharides are built from multiples of this base structural formula. Now, if you notice here, H2O, what is that? Well, that's water, right? And here we have carbon plus water. That actually needs, leads to the name carbo, or, um, carbohydrate. So it's a hydrate or hydration of carbon, okay? Uh, if we had two of these together, we would have C2H4O2. We can go keep going up. One of the most common uh, monosaccharides is something called glucose. That is C6H12O6. Again, another multiple, a six times a multiple of this base unit. Okay. Now, these monosaccharides are classified by two major characteristics. One is the location of the carbonyl group. What's a carbonyl group? I'm glad you asked. Remember, um, when we were talking about all the various uh, chemical functional groups, this is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Okay, so when I said you need to know these carb these um, chemical functional groups, this is why. I can't stop and explain what a carbonyl group is every time we encounter it, because we are going to encounter these functional groups a lot, okay? So if you feel uncomfortable uh, here, maybe you need to stop, go back, look at that functional group video again, review that section in the book, make sure you have these things down, okay? so. These, uh, this carbonyl group, which every um, monosaccharide has, can be located either at the end of a carbon chain or in the middle. So when it's at the end, it's an aldose. Uh, when it's in the middle, it's called a ketose. We'll explain this further here in a moment. So this is one thing, uh, thing that changes how we classify these monosaccharides. The second is simply the number of carbons in the carbon chain. Okay, so let's give you some examples. Here is a table where we have uh, going down groups of three carbon sugars, five carbon sugars, six carbon sugars, and we have it broken into two columns. In this column we have the aldoses, uh, which can also be called aldehyde sugars, or the ketoses, or ketone sugars, okay? So with the aldehyde sugars, we have the carbonyl group being present at the end. You can see here at the end, down here at the end, and this final carbon is also bonded to a hydrogen. The reason why we call these aldehyde sugars is together 
this is actually called an aldehyde group. This is yet another very common um, chemical group, one that we didn't go into just to keep it simple. Okay. If you have that carbonyl group internal, you don't have it at the end producing an aldehyde group, what you have are this are these ketone sugars. You can see here that this carbon is bonded on both sides by another carbon, right? So we don't have an aldehyde group, so we can't call it an aldehyde sugar. We call it a ketone sugar. Here we'll go down to, um, so here we have trioses or three carbon sugars, glyceraldehyde and uh, dehydroxyacetone. Here we have uh, ribose, which is a five carbon sugar, and ribulose. You see, you can see very similar uh, listed names, uh, ribo meaning five. As we start getting more and more complex sugars, we start running into a problem, okay? Remember that all of these carbons have four positions. Those are arranged around a tetrahedral structure. Remember that we can have isomers of those tetrahedral structures. This leads to many possible sugars that essentially have the exact same chemical formula, the exact same structural arrangement. It's just um, they're mirror images of each other. Okay, So each one of these carbons down the chain depending on how you arrange the hydrogen and hydroxyl groups can change what the name of that sugar is, okay? Now, I am not going to expect you to know the structures of all of these sugars or let alone all of the names, okay? As we advance in biology, you will get to that point, particularly in biochemistry, but for right now, I will be happy with you understanding a few simple things, such as ribose is a five carbon sugar, okay, or ribulose, either one. And to know that glucose, galactose, and fructose are all six carbon sugars, okay. I'm not even particularly uh, concerned about you guys, in, guys knowing which one is an aldo sugar, which one is a, is a keto sugar. I just want you to know the difference, okay, and understand that that is a difference in the sugars. Now, one thing that we can do with these um, hydrated carbon chains or these carbohydrates is we can actually form ring structures, okay? So let's give an example of that. Here we have the linear structure. You can imagine we have rotation around all of these bond angles. We can bend it. I remember each one of these isn't a flat structure. It's a tetrahedral here, a tetrahedron here, tetrahedron here. So we can bend it around, form a ring-like structure, and here we are going to take this carbon that has the carbonyl group, and we are going to react it with one of the hydroxyl functional groups, and we are going to essentially rearrange this molecule to form a ring-like structure. So here we have this carbon reacting with this oxygen. This proton kind of temporarily pops off and then moves down over here. You can see it present in this group over here. Notice we now no longer have a carbon with a double bond but this oxygen is still bound to two carbons, right? And this is the only oxygen that is bound to two carbons, and this carbon here is the only carbon that is bound to two oxygens, okay? And this has a functional significance when we get into the biochemical level. Right here, we're not going to worry about it. Now, when you form this rearrangement, it can happen one of two ways. Think of this 
temporarily as a planar ring structure, and we can have the OH groups present above and below the ring. Okay? Most of these above and belows are dictated by the actual sugar we have over here. So these are already arranged in a particular position. When we link it into a ring, they remain in those positions. But here, we're carrying out a chemical rearrangement. This can lead to two possibilities. The hydroxyl group for this carbon one being below the ring, which we call an alpha arrangement, or it being above the ring, which we call a beta arrangement. This can have some structural significance, which I will get into later. Okay, another way we can represent this ring is abbreviated. So what we've done is removed the C from these junction points, and we just imply that that carbon is in fact there. Remember that this is organic chemistry shorthand. It makes it easier for us to draw these things quickly. Okay. So let's move on to disaccharides. A disaccharide is formed when we have a dehydration reaction, again, the removal of water molecule, to join two monosaccharides together. Um, this covalent bond, when we have two monosaccharides together, we call a glycosidic linkage. Okay? Each class of macromolecule is going to have a slightly different covalent bond here. Okay? All formed through dehydration reaction, but what is being bonded to what changes. Okay? So uh, we're going to take a look at this here. So we're going to first take a look at the junction of um, glucose and fructose. And then we're going to look at the junction of some other things. Okay, These are called disaccharides because there are two saccharides. Di meaning two, saccharide meaning simple sugar. Right? Uh, so here we go. We are going to take these two things and we are going to bring them together. And remember, these are going to be linked by some type of enzyme that is recognizing each one of these subunits. So we bring these two together, we remove water, we get something called sucrose, which is a combination of glucose and fructose. Okay. Here we're going to take galactose and glucose, link it together, form something called lactose. Okay. Finally, here we have glucose and another glucose linked together, forming something that we call maltose. Okay. Each one of these sugars is found in unique places, all right? So sucrose is commonly found in uh, plant sap, okay, or the fluids uh, moved internally in plants. We take this, uh, particularly from beets and sugarcane, purify it, crystallize it, and this is table sugar, okay? So table sugar is actually a more complex sugar. It's not a simple sugar. Lactose is the sugar present in milk, okay, so we actually produce this ourselves. Maltose is kind of a break, usually a breakdown product of a much longer molecule called starch. But uh, we will find this present in uh, grains as they start to sprout, okay. This is also the sugar that is used to make beer. Right, so um, you might have heard the, the phrase malt liquor. That is because it is made primarily from maltose. 